Hi everyone, this is Maria Bruno. I'm coordinator of Ohio Votes. I'll be facilitating today's training session. So first off, what's Ohio Votes? It's a voterization initiative of Ohio. We're specifically targeting low-income and disenfranchised Ohio communities. It's a nonpartisan effort, and we're a member of the Ohio Voter Rights Coalition, which includes Ohio Voice, Common Cause Ohio, and League of Women Voters. So first off, why is registering voters important? especially low-income voters. Well, low-income voters have the uh, pattern of having underrepresentation in elections. Their turnouts tend to be lower than other populations. And voter registration is a great first step to creating a culture of civic engagement and getting more members of your community to speak up and participate in neighborhood activities, uh, as well as just uh, political activities as they come up. And also, elected officials pay attention to communities that show up to vote. So we want our community to be valued, and a great way to do that is to create a voting block that uh, elected officials need to listen to. Nonprofits specifically are a great um, pathway to reach these low-income voters. They're, you all are already a trusted organization and already embedded into the community. You don't have ulterior motives and a partisan agenda and you're in touch with the needs of the underrepresented populations we are hoping to reach. So this is probably the most important rule of the whole presentation, and that is that 501c3 nonprofit organizations cannot support or oppose a candidate for public office, endorse candidates or political parties, donate money or resources to candidates, or rate candidates on a single issue. So what you may do is you may explain what it means to register with a party or uh, provide nonpartisan voter guides. So basically, you could explain to someone, for example, if you were to talk about health care, you could explain to someone uh, perhaps the policy issues surrounding Medicaid and the expansion, uh, and you could outline which candidates hold which positions, but you couldn't say vote for candidate A because his position is better for you. It's a, it's a narrow line, but it is an important distinction. Please also note that nonprofits who receive community service block grant funding, such as community action agencies and Head Start agencies, may not use CSBG or Head Start funds to pay for staff and materials to conduct voter registration or use those funds to provide rides to the polls. Now, what that means is you cannot use that money. It does not mean that organizations cannot participate in those activities, but you cannot use um, those grants to fund the activities. AmeriCorps is members are also not allowed to conduct voter registration during work hours. I want to also clarify um, that while nonprofits as an entity cannot participate in partisan politics, you as individuals are entitled to your political opinions. What you do on your own time is totally uh, outside the scope of these rules. You can uh, behave in any manner you'd like, but once you're on, uh, once you're representing the C3, uh, organization, you must follow these nonpartisan rules. Okay, so today we have a lot to go over. I do tend to talk fast, so hopefully I will uh, keep it slow enough to remain easy to listen to. So today we're going to go over just the basics of registration, uh, what's going to be on the 2018 election ballot, and just other important dates and notes about the election. Then, of course, we'll go over the Ohio Votes Program. Uh, then we'll cover get out the vote strategies and just random additional information. Section 5 is probably the um, least pertinent to the work that you all will be doing, but I do think that you're likely to get the occasional question about those types of issues, so I wanted to include the information so you'll have somewhere to reference uh, if or when you receive those types of questions. So who can register to vote? Well, you must be a citizen of the United States. Uh, please note that is not the same as having legal status. There might be uh, legal refugees or green card holders, but unfortunately only citizens can uh, actually register to vote. You must be 18 year old, years old by the election date of the general election. So for instance, if you are only 17 on say the primary date, but over the summer you turn 18, you're allowed to vote in the primary because you will be 18 by the general election date. You must be a resident of Ohio for at least 30 days immediately before the election, and you're not currently in jail or prison for a felony conviction. Note that if you're awaiting trial 
or if you're on community control, you can still vote, but you must re-register uh, after you're released. I will go over this in a little bit more detail in a few slides. And also, if you have not been declared incompetent uh, or for voting by a probate court, uh, and also if you've never violated uh, election rules, I imagine that only applies to a very small sliver of people, so I didn't actually include that, but Please note, if you have been convicted of an election law violation, you are also not allowed to vote. And who can help others register to vote? Um, the main point I want to make here is that obviously all people who can register to vote can help others vote, with the exception of people convicted of a felony after 2006. I know that's a very specific carve-out exception, but that's just between all of the voting laws and litigation. That's just sort of how it's shaken out. Um, but note that minors and non-citizens can help register voters. So for instance, if you have a youth program or an organization that serves refugees, this would be a great way for them to feel involved in the election without actually being able to um, fill out a ballot themselves. So if you're assisting others with filling out the registration form, you might come across someone who's unable to fill out the form themselves. And you might be wondering what you're allowed to do as someone who's helping them register. So. If your voter is actually able to completely fill out and sign the form without assistance, you don't need to sign the form. You can just um, collect it and be on your way. If the voter is unable to complete the form but is able to sign her name, you may help that person fill out their form. And as long as that person can sign their own voter registration form, you do not need to put your name. The only time that a volunteer who is helping someone register to vote needs to include their own name is if that voter is unable to sign his name, in which case they would do their best to make an X, which would serve, and then you would write your name right underneath that X. So your signature, or I should say just the spelling of your name, serves as proof of a witness and confirms that the voter intends to register as a voter. Who needs to re-register to vote? Anyone who has moved in the past uh, since the past election obviously needs to register, people who've changed their name, people who have not re-registered after getting out of prison or jail for a felony conviction, and people who may have been purged. We recommend that if you haven't vote, voted within the last two years, you should at least confirm your registration. And if there's any um, concern that you might be not registered or not properly registered, err on the side of re-registration. And then how can you register to vote? You actually have two ways. You can fill out a voter, a standard paper voter form and drop it off at, or mail it to your county's board of elections. Or we actually have online voter registration. You can go to ohvotes.org, which, which will allow you to put in the voter's information, check their registration status, and please note it will also tell you if that person is on the at risk of being purged list. Unfortunately, if you're going to do any of this on, or any registrations online, you actually have to have an Ohio license or a D-card number. Okay, if you are voting with a felony conviction, this is a big mis misconception that once you actually are convicted of a crime, you can no longer register to vote. That is not true. If you are, first of all, if you're incarcerated uh, for a misdemeanor or while you await any felony conviction, you are still entitled to vote. Um, if you have been convicted of a felony but have since been released from incarceration, that includes parole, probation, halfway houses, et cetera, you still have the right to vote. The only um, add-on here is that you will be uh, automatically removed from the voter rolls if you're convicted of a felony and therefore will need to re-register to vote. Okay, so what address should you use? Well, obviously there's going to be people who um, come with the issue that they are homeless and don't have a permanent address. Your voter registration forms requires one. So state law defines home as any place you intend to return. Um, and they have clarified that if you are homeless, you can use a shelter or other agency where you can receive mail. So one thing your agencies can do is offer to serve as a address for um, homeless people and you can you know, take the responsibility for making sure they get their registration confirmation um, and provide that address for them so that they don't have to worry about that issue. Additionally, college students. Some are from Ohio, some aren't. If you're not from Ohio, 
you are still uh, allowed to vote in Ohio because you are re residing in it currently. However, as one might guess, you can only be registered in one state. So if you're not registered, if you're not from Ohio, but you want to register to vote uh, at your school address in Ohio, that's fine. But you can't be registered in mul multiple states. Additionally, students who um, have a different permanent address can vote at their local address. So let's say there's someone from Cleveland who goes to school in Columbus. Uh, that person could use their Cleveland address, their permanent address, but they could also use their current student address. Um, obviously, again, you can only be registered one place. Uh, and also note that you have to vote where you're registered. So if you are in Columbus but registered in Cleveland, you can't show up to Columbus and expect to cast your Cleveland ballot. You actually have to go to your Cleveland voting site or uh, request a mail-in ballot uh, in a timely manner and vice versa. Um, if students are unsure how to bring proof of address, First of all, your ID does not need to match your voter registration address. This is a really important point. Unfortunately, we can't always rely on uh, poll workers to be well informed about all of these little rule nuances. So it can sometimes make your life easier if you bring proof of address just in case. Again, you shouldn't have to, but the reality is sometimes it just makes your life easier. Uh, students and dorms may request an address verification from their university. They obviously won't have a utility bill but they can still provide proof of residence that way. Most common registration errors are incomplete registration forms, illegible handwriting, invalid or outdated registration, which includes having the wrong address, having a former name, or being purged from the rolls, uh, wrongly believing they are registered, but they are not. Um, that's a big problem. A lot of people will say they're registered, but when you actually look it up, they're registrations at an old address or they are not actually registered. Um, that happens quite frequently. So even if someone is confident about it, it is best practice to just check anyway. It's easy and quick enough to do. Also, a lot of people wrongly believe that if you request an absentee ballot, you're also registering to vote. Um, for example, in 2016, 15 to 21% of low-income voters in Cuyahoga County who requested a mail-in ballot were not actually registered. Um, and that is significantly higher than other income brackets. So this does seem to be a problem more pervasive in low-income communities. Uh, but make sure that your um, clients make sure that they know that they can request an absentee ballot, uh, but they have to have proper res registration to have that request approved. So the 2018 ballot, there is a ton of stuff on it. Um, among other things, it's the US Senator, the Ohio Governor, Ohio Secretary of State, um, two Ohio Supreme Court justices, as well as all of your local um, issues. It's very likely as well that we'll have um, that criminal justice reform bill um, actually showing up on our ballot, which would um, lower the classification for certain drug-related felonies and um, increase programming for diversions such as um, drug treatment, et cetera. So all of those are gonna be on your ballot. It's a really significant election, but a lot of people, because it's not a presidential year, don't really uh, appreciate that. So that's a great way to inform your clients of the importance of this election. Important dates. Uh, obviously, we're past July 10th, but that is when early voting has begun for uh, the August special election, and you can vote for that election uh, through August 7th, which is at the actual special election day. Um, and then September 25th, I'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a few slides, but that is National Voter Registration Day, which I'd like to uh, get as close to a national holiday as we can uh, get here. October 9th is the last day to register to vote for the November 18th election. October 10th is the first day of early voting, and November 6th, of course, is election day. Okay, so this is more just for you to understand the background of how uh, the elections are actually administered. So the Secretary of State's office oversees all of the Ohio elections procedures. Um, they are the ones who set the rules for um, some of the more intricate directives that aren't covered under just the general state voting laws. They also are the runners of a website you'll see is myohiovote.com. Um, it contains all the voting documents, such as the forms, uh, and also just has all of the rules. Um, I find it sort of difficult to navigate, um, so we've actually uh, made our own sort of voter porthole 
called ohvotes.org. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but that's another option um, for you to use for your constituents. Uh, as well, just generally, if you have questions about voting, um, you can contact the Secretary of State's office, but just because it's a statewide office, it tends to be less responsive than the county boards of election. The county boards of elections are sort of the local election administrations. Um, they're the ones where you actually send your voter registration form. Uh, they're generally going to be more responsive and easier to get a hold of, uh, especially for localized questions. Um, that's some Boards of elections are better than others. It does vary a lot by county, but um, that is a great uh, sort of shortcut to getting your questions about voting answered. Uh, the boards of election are also who um, set the early voting locations and hours. It's usually at the boards of election office, but not always. So you should look that up for your county so you can educate voters on where they go to early vote. Um, they'll also provide official forms in large batches. So if you know you have an event where you will need 100 or 200 and you don't feel like printing your own, um, you can just request them from the county's board of elections and the Secretary of State's office, but you can, you can um, contact the boards of elections and just get a stockpile from them. Um, the quality of their websites and online resources varies greatly. Uh, the bigger counties, as one might expect, have uh, tend to have more robust online presence. Uh, as well as just an easier to navigate website. So especially as you get into the very small counties, um, if their websites get uh, a little bit more uh, scarce. You might actually have to call them physically like the old fashioned way uh, to find out more about early voting. But um, yeah, so just so you understand the basic framework of how elections in Ohio are organized. So our program, um, if you are a partner with Ohio Votes, you receive a handful of perks. That includes some training, such as this one, uh, nonpartisan voter literature, such as large posters, informational handouts, pledge cards, and up-to-date voting information, assistance in planning. Um, I have contacted many of you individually, but uh, you should submit your program plan form and we can discuss more specifics about your planning, uh, and guidance through the Get Out the Vote program, which includes uh, a toolkit with step-by-step -step instructions for setting up your program, as well as other methods of just helping you guide you through this uh, process. And then assistance and staffing. We're actually partnering with the League of Women Voters and we're going to sort of combine resources so we can help um, line up voter registration opportunities with voter registration volunteers um, as much as we can. Those will vary by area, so don't rely on that as an automatic way to receive um, some volunteer help but it is available and the more notice you can give them, the more likely we are to be able to find volunteers. Um, obviously the bigger cities, there's more likely to be volunteers, but we do have some legal women voters chapters in, uh, in smaller jurisdictions. So, you know, it's, it's worth asking even um, if we might have to say that we don't have resources in the area. So your responsibilities, first of all, you're, you'll appoint a site get out the vote coordinator, which is an SGC. Um, if necessary, in a perfect world, there would be an SGC for each site. Um, if necessary, they can cover up to five sites. I know that um, organizations have varied capacities, um, but it is just easier if you have you know, a reasonable amount of territory to cover. But you will be my central contact person. So when I have a question or concern about this specific site, you're my go-to person. And similarly, you, know, you can contact me, but primarily you'll be the one who uh, relays any concern about voting from your organization to Ohio Votes. Um, so we ask that the SGCs uh, attend an Ohio Votes training such as this one, um, or if you'd like to do it remotely, this is uh, a recording that will be available to you. You'll just have to complete a short quiz afterwards, um, purely so I, I know that you understand the basic uh, rules and procedures. So you should also try your best to plan an event on National Voter Registration Day, which is September 25th. <clears throat> Follow Ohio Votes uh, voter information intake process. We hope that you will sort of be able to internally maintain quality control. I'll go over the specifics of the process in a second here. Um, 
but basically you have to send some of the forms to us, some of the forms to the Boards of Election, and we want to make sure that you do that in a consistent way so that we can keep track of everyone and also uh, make sure that we get those government forms in uh, turned in. Uh, you also should have or should in the future fill out what's called a program plan form. Uh, we've really boiled it down to as simple um, of opportunities as we can so you actually just go through and check the things that you plan to do and then I'll follow up with you to discuss some more specifics about uh, how you plan to execute your program plan. Obviously if you you know start doing this and you realize you actually want to expand your program that's great we encourage that try to keep me in the loop if you can um, you can just shoot me an email be like we're adding these three events that's perfect. Um, if you decide that you're actually going to scale back what you had originally planned to do, whether it's because of lack of resources or whatever it might be, also just keep me in the loop because I'm sort of going to assume that the program plans are representative of your program. Um, and if they're updated, that's fine. I understand that's how sort of these things go, but just um, keep me updated on what's going on. We also ask that you publicize voting related opportunities wherever possible. So that includes newsletters, social media, um, posters, just wherever your uh, clients get their information, just make sure you're including voter information. And then we'll have monthly check-in calls beginning in August going through election day. And those check-in calls will just be making sure that everyone um, has what they need, is um, being able to execute their program without any problems and just uh, sort of making sure that we're all on the same page. Okay, so the site DOTV coordinator, um, this is more or less encompassed than the previous slide, but basically you're my primary contact. You're the person who's going to make sure that the program plan form is actually filled out and turned into us. Uh, you're the one that's going to attend a training or um, do it remotely and fill out the quiz. Uh, you'll be the person I'll be asking to make sure that you're overseeing the planning, staffing, and execution of your Get Out the Vote programming. Um, you're the one that will be recruiting helpers, submitting the literature order form, and really uh, acting as the quality control for your program to make sure that uh, the intake procedure is being followed. Um, and then again, the monthly check-in calls. So our intake process. Ohio Votes will be collecting voter data throughout this program through three forms. The first will be the voter registration form. This is obviously the form you turn in to register to vote. Um, the second is the pledge card, which is basically a voter's pledge to vote for the election. That includes, um, you can sort of see in this tiny thumbnail, the bottom half will basically have their general information. We'll keep that half. Uh, and then the top half will be something that they can take sort of as a receipt uh, that will include the early voting information, um, a hotline number to call, and just generally uh, give voters something that they can throw up on the fridge to remember to actually vote. And then cover sheets. The cover sheets will keep track of the chain of command for the voter forms and the pledge cards. And they'll also keep track of each organization's and each site's progress. Um, so the way that this will work is you will have um, voter registration forms as well as pledge cards. <clears throat> you definitely want to do voter registration primarily through October 9th, but the pledge cards are a great way if you um, you have someone who's already registered to vote, but you'd like to collect their information and then give them a voting reminder, you can do that through the pledge card. Um, so that's sort of your option. And then obviously after October 9th, when the registration is deadline is closed, will be exclusively pledge cards because it'll be too late to register for the November election. So you'll have voters fill out those two forms. You'll then have whichever um, person is actually helping that voter fill out the form, fill out a end of, end of um, shift cover sheet, and that will pretty much just include that person's name, the get up, you know, what site they're at, who their court SGC is, um, how many forms they collected, and um, it sort of just provides a check on making sure that people are keeping track of their daily progress, and more importantly, that we can keep track of the chain of command. Uh, hopefully this will never be an issue, but if there were to be a question about someone's voter registration, we could actually go back and track who helped that person register and figure out what happened. Um, it also helps us just give you credit for the work you're doing. I mean, if you're uh, submitting a bunch of voter registration forms and pledge cards, I want to make sure that uh, you're getting the recognition that you deserve because this works hard and important and um, it's very valuable. So then you will turn the original registration forms without any cover sheets, without any um, pledge cards into the Board of Elections. You can mail it to them. 
Um, and obviously, if you do online voter registration, that's how they do that. But yeah, you'll just mail them, mail them only the form. But that will be after you have made copies of those forms, and you will then send Ohio Vote the pledge cards, um, the copies of the voter forms, and both will have the cover sheets uh, on top of the appropriate uh, forms. So, you know, you'll have one cover sheet and then the, let's say, 10 voter forms that someone submitted during their shift and the five pledge cards that that person submitted in their shift. Um, and let's say you had a second person, that second person would fill out their own cover sheet uh, with their own voter forms and pledge cards. So it would be sort of these like, you know, if you were to have many people collecting forms at the same time, you'd sort of have these mini piles of um, what that individual helper actually helped uh, register. Okay, so voter registration day is September 25th. Um, mark your calendars. Um, please do your best to try to have some sort of voter outreach on this day. Uh, it doesn't have to be the, you know, a carnival. It can be an ice cream social or, you know, a special time carved out at mealtime where you're really going to be um, motivating voters to register. Uh, we'll have specific phone calls and organizing stuff around the National Voter Registration Day. Um, I'm hoping to make this as close to a national holiday as we can, so I really want to uh, encourage everyone to sort of participate in our joint effort. We'll eventually um, adopt a model very similar to what Cleveland Votes does. We'll um, actually have an announcement that will announce all of our different activities on uh, voter registration day and um, sort of celebrate everyone's uh, participation in this activity. So hopefully it might uh, give us some press coverage as well as just sort of galvanize low-income voters. OHVotes.org. Unfortunately, it's not Ohio spelled out. It's OHVotes. Um, that will take a little get, getting used to, but um, it's an important distinction. So make sure that you devote that to memory. Um, why should you use this as opposed to my Ohio Votes or another website? Um, so basically, this is Ohio Votes uh, porthole specifically designed for voters. Um, you'll see it's very mobile friendly as well as um, it contains voter specific links. So the first link is to have someone check the registration status. It'll actually alert them if um, they are on the at risk of being purged list so they can immediately re-register there. Um, and then also it'll have an online pledge to vote card so people can check the registration and pledge to vote. Um, and then it also has these general links to polling location uh, and other pertinent voting information. I think it's a little easier to navigate than my Ohio votes. Um, and also a very big benefit for us is we can collect that voter's information and actually follow up with them uh, with voting reminders and um, we can keep track of our success so you can actually see how many voters, um, you know, followed up and actually showed up to vote. Okay, so publicity. Um, we have a few different ways that we're going to try to uh, get some publicity for this event. Uh, the first is Why Ohio Votes. Um, we actually will have a campaign that will have community leaders um, take the lead by recording a short video uh, about why they plan to vote. And we're hoping that it sort of starts like a chain reaction, similar to the um, water bucket challenge that everyone is so familiar with. But basically, you'll record a video up to a minute stating why you plan to vote, and then you will nominate three people to do the same. Um, I have my example video that you should have got an email that includes that um, if you're looking for an example. But we encourage you to start, start it off by doing your own video or getting someone, uh, a member of your community that seems uh, particularly passionate about voting, get them to record a video. Um, and it's a great way to engage your community and have them get, you know, get them thinking about not just how to vote, but why they vote. As you have events, make sure that you're taking pictures and videos and just send them over to us whenever you uh, have some good stuff. We would love to, one, give your organization some publicity about the work you're doing in the community um, and also motivate other partners to sort of keep up with you. You know, So if you have a really cool event, we'd love to see pictures and videos. If you get press inquiries, I doubt you will, but if you were to, um, specifically regarding Ohio Votes, you can redirect them to our community or our communications director, Margaret Roth. You have his contact information right there on this slide. 
Uh, if you get asked about voting in general, just stick to our messaging. We'll talk about that in a few slides, but just you know, stick to those messages and empower, empowering voters through a nonpartisan message. Uh, and then social media. We have a Facebook page specifically designated to Ohio votes. Uh, as of right now, at least, we just use Ohio's general Twitter account, but we do post the occasional voting update. Um, and then just another side note about your own social media. Uh, this is back to the 501c3s remaining um, nonpartisan, but just some sort of, I guess, easy mistakes to make are um, asking within your organization's social media page to like or support uh, candidates. Um, just make sure you don't do that. Again, what you do on your own personal social media is your business, but um, as far as the organization, social media, that could get you in trouble or accused of not executing an actual nonpartisan program. Okay, so we will have an abundance of voter uh, education literature. We are utilizing uh, the resources that a bunch of our uh, partners who also care about voting rights have already sort of developed. So we'll be using existing uh, literature from the League of Women Voters, ACLU, Disability Rights Ohio, Ohio Voter Rights Coalition, um, and basically we will be consolidating all of that into one form. So you'll be able to actually get this form. It'll have pictures of each of the documents and you can go on to the side and order which ones appeal to you. Um, we'll have educational material that'll include hopefully a statewide voters guide. And they will definitely include that, um, we had a picture of it earlier, but the voting with a felony conviction card from the ACLU, voting with a disability, your different options and rights, and then a general voter empowerment card. Um, but we also will include some empowering posters. These are uh, designed by Ohio Votes. We actually have had two focus groups with low-income voters just to see um, what they like and dislike about the messaging and the graphics and all of that. And so these have been a product of uh, many discussions and collaborations, and this is what we've ended up with. Uh, and those will also be included on our voter um, literature order form, so you can request posters. Um, additionally, these posters will actually have um, an add-on, and the add-on will just be like a plain, uh, plain piece of paper that you can print um, at your own organization's office, and that paper will have tear-off sheets with Ohio Votes' website, ohvotes.org, um, as well as just a basic announcement about the most pertinent voted, voting information. So, for instance, right now, it'll probably just say, like, what will be on the ballot. So, you know, think voting doesn't matter. Well, this year we'll be electing the governor and the U.S. senator, et cetera. Um, but as we move closer, it might instead say, vote early at this location, here are the voting hours, um, or something that's more um, specific on the message that you need in that moment. So we will send that with you automatically uh, when you order posters. Focus on registering voters until October 9th. Um, it doesn't matter how much they care about voting if they're not properly registered. So make sure you're publicizing the election, hang posters and registration information in high traffic areas, include instructions and deadlines on your bulletin boards and your newsletters and your email blasts and other publications, and then remind voters how many important elections are happening this year. Um, and then next, become a voting resource for your clients. Um, have the educational literature on hand. Train your staff to field basic questions. And if they don't know the answer to questions, um, give them a way to help voters find the answers to those, uh, whether it's contacting you or going to a specific website uh, or referencing a specific document. But basically, just um, create an atmosphere in which a voter feels comfortable sort of asking the hows and whys and where to vote uh, with your agency. And then also have voter registration forms at the front desk uh, with a completion and submission process for you know, whoever might work at the front desk. Uh, those forms do have to be turned in within 10 days of completion. So you have to make sure that you, know, you can't just leave them in a box until October 9th. You have to make sure that you are regularly submitting these documents. And then another way to become a resource is just have a booth or section of voter registration opportunities and get out the vote literature at non-voting specific events. So that can be a resident meeting, a summer carnival, um, a meal, you know, whatever you kind of already have going on, you can just tack on some voting activities. Um, make sure you're taking advantage of 
creating direct voter outreach opportunities, so advertising the programming in your announcements and posters, um, mobilizing your helpers to solicit voter registration forms from clients. That could be, you know, perhaps if you have a uh, group meal, you can have someone be actually walking around and asking people directly if they're registered to vote, helping them check their registration status. Um, and also try to plan at least one specific voter registration event. Um, if you're not sure when that will be, I recommend September 25th, which is our voting holiday that we are establishing. Um, and so that would be a great way to sort of um, kill two birds with one stone, as they say. And it doesn't have to be a huge voter registration event. You know, I mean, it can be as simple as buying a few of those big tubs of ice cream and um, including a registration table um, in your lobby. You know, it doesn't have to be uh, this big grand carnival. It can be um, something very simple. Create a culture of civic engagement. So create educational programming. Um, tell people what's on their ballot, what, what kind of issues are important, and uh, how the mechanics of some of the policies work. Um, advise people on how candidates uh, position themselves for issues that seem important to them. Again, make sure to steer clear of uh, specifically advocating for a specific candidate, but um, you are encouraged to educate your clients on who will actually be showing up on the ballot. And then open up a dialogue about voting and issues. It's, it's actually amazing how easy um, this can be. You know, you can just sort of throw out a couple uh, big ideas and people uh, can get responsive and fired up and they can talk about it and hopefully they can do that in a civil manner. But uh, the more people start to uh, talk about these issues, one, the more that they'll learn about them, but also the more um, empowered they'll be, feel to actually participate uh, in the election because they'll start to use their voice and realize their voice is valuable and um, hopefully exercise the right to vote as a result. And then get your clients involved in voter empowerment programs. So if you have a few, one or a few people who are really excited about um, your embrace of these voter registration opportunities, you know, use that person. Have them record a Why Ohio Votes video. Um, have their, you know, help recruit your friend, their friends to show up to an event. Um, help train them on what the importance of voting and some of the ins and outs of voting. Um, I think some empowerment is a lot more meaningful when it actually comes from up here as opposed to someone who happens to work in the building they live. Um, and then don't overthink it. <laughs> I think a lot of people uh, think of this program and they get a little like, intimidated, but honestly there are a lot of ways to add voter registration programs and forms to your existing program. So, um, you know, think about ways to incorporate it easily into your infrastructure. You can add voter registration forms to your intake process, to your exit process, to the services that you already provide. Um, if you have other methods of um, giving your clients information, add voter registration to that list. Um, and then solicit registrations during existing gatherings. Um, again, that can be during mealtime, at residence events, and um, other community events. But beginning October 10th, we'd like you to uh, shift over to get out the vote. Advertise early voting opportunities and where they um, take advantage of that. Um, inform clients about mail-in ballots, especially if the clients are elderly or have a physical disability. This is going to be something they either don't know about or um, don't know how to pursue or um, don't know deadlines. So, you know, the more you can help them through that process, uh, the better. Collect voter pledge cards. Um, they might sound silly and a little pointless, but they actually have been proven statistically to increase turnout. So that is a good investment of time. Um, and it's a great way to collect voter information after registration, um, re the registration period is closed. So that kind of um, gives us an advantage because we can follow up with those voters and actually see if they showed up to vote or we can text them reminders on um, how and where to vote. Um, so that can be a very helpful endeavor. And then try to plan at least one early voting outing. Uh, bus your clients to your county's early voting polling location. Create a voting buddy system if you can't do that. I think a lot of people who said they prefer to vote on election day said they, they prefer that because they um, have an easier time getting to the polling location because it's um, usually within walking distance, but also because they like the energy of election day. So the more you can sort of recreate that, the more you can motivate people to vote early. Um, and so if you match up rides with those who need transportation and encourage groups to go together, 
you can make voting that fun social activity um, and also get your constituents out to vote early. Okay, so as far as messaging strategies, if you're speaking to staff or boards or press or community leaders, someone that you need to be a little bit more formal, um, you know, you can keep the message pretty simple. We're working to empower low-income Ohioans. Our organization is working to ensure people who we represent are represented in the democratic process. To voters, make sure you're staying positive. Uh, voting is easy, fun, and important. Say that to yourself five times fast. Easy, fun, and important. Um, you know, everybody's doing it is sort of the angle we're taking. And the reason is because voter turnout tends to be higher when voters believe turnout will be high. Um, peer pressure works in this case. So, you know, don't tell people that uh, no one's showing up this year because they won't feel like that's something that they need to do. Um, you know, make, make sure people know that this is their opportunity to exercise their constitutional right, uh, that their voice is important and they should use it. Um, and then, you know, they, if they want to be advocates for themselves, this is a great way to do that. Um, and then lastly, obviously, political leaders pay attention to people and communities that vote. So if you can, you know, get a group to vote, that group is more likely to be paid attention to once those people are actually elected. Okay, so the site uh, DOTV coordinators, SGCs, are responsible for ensuring that helpers are adequately trained. Um, that includes understanding and following the Ohio Votes Intake Procedure that I explained earlier, um, and just know the basics of voting rights so that they can help field questions from your clients, um, that they properly fill out and track their cover sheets, um, and that they know how to check the voter registration form to confirm that it's been fully completed, uh, and turn in completed registration forms within 10 days. Uh, you don't have to work too hard to train helpers. We are going to give you this recording of a training session, so you should be able to, you know, make them watch it on their own time or relay the messaging or really, you know, do whatever you think is adequate to train your helpers. We're going to uh, defer to you to know how best to make sure your employees and helpers are ready to help voters um, vote. Um, one another way to sort of utilize our existing training is to just have like an on-site viewing of the webinar so you can make sure people actually watch it. Um, wouldn't be the most exciting movie showing, but um, you know, it'll be effective, I would think. Uh, and then you can create your own educational material or presentation um, if you are willing and interested in doing that. The don'ts. Don't make voting sound hard. Or scary. The more people who uh, are intimidated by the process, the more they won't show up. Don't tell voters to expect low turnout. Um, weirdly enough, that discourages participation. Um, don't suggest or endorse a specific candidate, as I've mentioned a few times. Don't make up answers. If you aren't sure, ask us. That's what we're here for. Um, obviously, don't belittle, confront, or intimidate the voter. And um, don't mandate or force registration. As much as people have the right to vote, and we hope they take advantage of it, they also have the right not to vote. So um, don't ever mandate it or require it. Uh, you can um, just make it sound appealing enough that they'll want to register, but if they really are against it, then that's their prerogative. Um, so this is sort of, sort of more in the weeds voting things. I'm not going to cover all of these slides um, in detail, I'm just going to go over them quickly, uh, and then you can review them on your own time as you feel necessary. The biggest things to know uh, about the ballots is that there's a different ID requirement for election day ballots and early in-person and mail-in ballots. If you vote on election day, you have to have a proper ID. If you vote early, you only need the last four digits of your social security number. Especially with low-income voters, this can be a huge difference. Uh, many people don't have a utility bill or a bank statement um, or a driver's license, which are the frequent forms of acceptable ID. Uh, so this is a way to allow those people a little bit more ease in voting is to take advantage of the uh, early in-person or the mail-in option. Um, for mail-in ballots, you can start requesting them now. Um, you can request them 90 days before the election. Um, once you and you do that by filling out the absentee ballot request form. I included that in your Get Out the Vote toolkit. So you should have a copy of that form. If you can't find it uh, for whatever reason, it's also available on the Secretary of State website. And then once you've filled out that request form, uh, you obviously mail it. And 
you'll receive your ballot in the mail as long as you are already properly registered. Um, you'll then complete your ballot and you'll mail it in. So um, the only thing is you have to mail in the ballot by the Monday before the election. If you were to um, forget to mail it in and you realize it's election day, you have two options, one of which is to still drop it off at the county boards of election. Uh, you can't mail it, you'd have to drop it off at that point. Um, but also you could vote provisionally at your polling place. Um, we would definitely prefer that you just get the mail-in ballot in, uh, but that is an available option if you can't do that. Um, again, please note that requesting an absentee ballot is not the same as registering to vote. Uh, so many voters are confused by that. Just make sure that they are aware that they already need to have voter registration um, status confirmed prior to requesting the absentee ballot. Uh, if they don't, their request will be denied. Uh, and then provisional ballot, uh, this is sort of used whenever a voter's el eligibility is in question. I'm not going to go through when really it's utilized. All you need to know is that uh, we prefer that you don't have to cast provisional ballots and um, probably more substantially the biggest note is that if you were to cast a provisional ballot in the wrong precinct, it is not counted. So if a um, if a voter goes to a precinct and they are not on the register registration rolls that they think they should be, they should find out if they're on the registration rolls somewhere else. And actually, a poll workers are supposed to um, help voters figure that out. That doesn't always happen. So make sure that the voters are proactive about asserting their rights and um, soliciting help if they think there's a mistake. Um, just generally, some barriers to voting. Um, there's sort of two types of barriers to voting. There's the systemic barriers, which are uh, oppressive rules, uh, poll workers being wrongly or under-trained, uh, changes to voter rolls can cause a lot of confusion and just um, lack of resources, whether it's not having enough um, advertisements about voting or um, that can show up in a bunch of different ways. As well as individual barriers to voting, which is when this individual cannot vote for a variety of different reasons. These come up a lot more frequently for low-income voters. Some of the most common barriers are disability, lack of transportation, lack of availability, a problem with the registration, and not having proper ID. So just be aware to try to minimize all of those different barriers. I do want to briefly address the voter purge. Um, people seem to be relatively confused about it, which is understandable because it is confusing. Basically, here's what you need to know. If someone is registered as of today, they will not be purged prior to the November election. If someone hasn't voted in the last two years, we highly encourage them to just double check that they're pro properly registered. And really, even if you have voted in the last two years, it never hurts to confirm that you registered at the right address. Um, that all being said, if you are still registered by November 8th for the November 8th, 2018 election, you still may be at risk of being purged after the election. Um, if you actually go to ohvotes.org, we, our website, when we look up your registration, will also tell you if you are sort of at risk of being uh, purged. And if you are, we encourage you to re-register to just avoid that whole uh, problem. And then there were directives announced in early July that seemed to just confuse everyone. Basically, all it says is if you were to be on that at-risk list and therefore in need of confirming with Ohio that you still live where you say you live um, and still need to be properly registered, well, let's say you renew your license for that same address as you had the uh, registration in question. If those addresses and name match, uh, match, match <laughs> you will automatically be uh, removed from that at-risk voting record and confirmed as properly registered to vote. Um, just to clarify, if the names or date uh, address don't match, it's just nothing happens. Um, so just so you know all of that. As far as voter suppression, um, voters, voter purge, voter fraud, all of those things, just one, don't assume that the poll workers already always know the rules. Um, unfortunately, that's not always the case. Make sure you're correcting rumors and misinformation um, that is causing confu uh, confusion or discouraging voters from showing up to the polls. Remember that voter fraud is often just used as sort of a tactic to discourage 
voters from participating in the elections. And specifically, it often is targeting low-income voters and voters of color. So uh, make sure that you really sort of squash those, that talk about voter fraud. And then remind people that the election is safe and secure. Uh, the Ohio Voting Rights Coalition has a campaign called Verify Your Vote. Um, so I encourage you to check that out if you need more information on that. Um, this, again, is more relevant just for Election Day, but just so you know, there is a voting hotline that will coach you through different, uh, different voting issues, especially if someone goes to vote and is having on-site problems. This is a great resource. Uh, they can call this hotline. They can figure out the status of their voter registration, their polling location, as well as report violations to uh, voting rights. And then, again, I mentioned the Verify Your Vote campaign. Uh, many people think they're registered and actually aren't. And also, there's a way to sort of uh, verify your vote in real time. So if voters are uh, voting, they can actually have the selection on the side, which will sort of confirm uh, who they're voting for and what they're voting for. And they can actually check it themselves so they can go home comfortable that their uh, vote was adequately um, recorded. So in summary, be nonpartisan. Tell your clients to vote, but don't tell them who to vote for. Stay positive. Focus on an empowering message. Educate your, yourself and your staff on voting basics. Maintain quality control. Make sure that you're submitting all the forms where they go properly and timely. And have fun. This should really be a way to create positive, positive motivating energy in your community and encourage uh, an increase in civic engagement among your community. So thank you. That is all uh, I have on this matter. If you need to get a hold of me, my email is mariabruno at cohio.org or our communications director, if it's uh, to be more communications or press related, uh, I encourage you to email our communications director, Marcus Roth at marcusroth at cohio.org. Um, and then visit our website if you're looking for our voter portal, so ohvotes.org. Uh, thank you, and that is all.